We just come to you today in prayer, Lord. We thank you for who you are and all that you do in our lives, God, for bringing us here to this holy place, God, this morning. God, I just pray a blanket of love over this next message, God, that you would just touch this entire service with your Holy Spirit, that it would just flood people's lives, God, and give them no choice but to just surrender to you. God, we say all these things in your name. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, TE Church. Wow, packed house today. Good to see you guys. Man, worship is great in this place. I love this church, and I love the fact that we've got so many exciting things going on here. And one of the really exciting things that's coming up in October is our women's event, our limitless women's event called Impact. And if you haven't heard about Impact, you've got to come. I know some of you, I know some of you have signed up, but I know some of you haven't. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about that person, that friend of yours who needs some hope, who needs some encouragement, who needs some inspiration, who needs a friend to say, come with me, come to this event with me, and let's have some fun together, and let's do it with a bunch of gals together. I'm telling you, every event that we have, people are saying, when's the next one? So what I want you to do today, if you haven't signed up online, that's the best way to do it, but if you want to pay cash or check, the tickets are only $10. Shoot, you could buy for one for you and a friend. Go straight out these doors to the impact table, and we've got gals out there that will sign you up today so you don't even have to worry about it. You just write your email down, just pay cash or check, and they'll take care of your tickets. When you show up for the event on October the 9th, Everything's taken care of. That's a deal, right? Yeah. That's a deal. So listen, let's get there. Cindy Beal, you got to check her out, you guys. She's an awesome speaker. She's from a gigantic church called Life Church, Craig Rochelle's church. She was there from the very beginning. You got to check her out. You got to come. I'm telling you, you will not regret it. Another exciting thing happening in October is our 412 Middle School Retreat. Let's give it up for that. Yeah, October the 10th which is a Saturday until a Sunday, our kids will be going to a retreat and they'll be coming back the next day and all attending our one o'clock service together. So they're gonna get all jazzed up. I'm assuming they're having snacks and candy and all, right? So they'll get all jazzed up. They'll come in Sunday for an awesome service and all of our kids will have a section over here. Hey, hey by the way, look at this awesome section we have. Yeah, our youth section, we love that. So listen guys, we're in week three of our series and you are going to hear an awesome message today. Get ready. Thanks. Eleven o'clock, how we doing today? Good to see you guys. Glad that you guys are here for the final week of our Voice series. It's been an incredible series so far. Can't believe this is already the last week, but really, this is my favorite message of the whole series. I'm talking about something that's dear to my heart today. I'm talking about haters. Anybody know any haters? Anybody got any haters today? Anybody in the church a hater today? Just keep your hand up. Come on, it's all right. We've all hated. We've been there. Here's what I know. Haters gonna hate. Right? Haters going to hate, but we've got to learn to shake it off. So look to the person beside you. Say, haters going to hate, but you've got to shake it off. Haters going to hate, you got to shake it off. Let's talk about the anatomy of a hater. 
A hater is someone that wants you to look small so that they can look tall. A hater is someone that wants you to be less than so that they can become greater than. A hater is someone that wants you to be pushed down so that they can feel built up. A hater is someone that is much louder about what they're against than what they're for. A hater is more interested in the problem than the solution. Haters are going to hate. So I was thinking about this, and I thought, what are we going to do with this? And I thought, what am I going to preach on? I thought, well, I could preach on a message about using our voice to overcome the voice of haters, how to really hear God's voice instead of the haters' voice. And I thought, I'm going to preach on something way more fun than that. I'm going to preach on how to respond to haters, how we as a church can learn to respond. Because hating is different now. Criticism is different now than it was before. Criticism before used to be a letter to the editor. And it was here one day, and then it was gone. But now because of the internet, hating is three things. It's global, it's permanent, and it's searchable. And it's important for us, we collectively, as a church, and you individually, to learn how to respond to haters. Because I promise you, the more influence that you have, the more effective you become, the larger you are, the more impact that you have, the larger the target will be on your back. And there's a right way and a wrong way, a God way and a good way to respond to haters. I want to look at the God way today. Psalm 69, 4. Anybody feel like this? Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I'm forced to restore what I did not steal. Anybody feel like that? That you've not even done anything. And there's people that just come against you. They don't want to see you succeed. But what I want to talk to you about is the good news. We preach good news in this church. Matthew 5, 11, Jesus said this, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Here's what I know. Haters going to hate, but God's going to bless. Right? Haters going to hate, but God is going to bless. So Romans 12, 18 says, so do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So I want to look at a story in the Bible found in the first book called Genesis. Genesis means origin, where something comes from. And, and it's a story about a guy named Joseph. And here's what it says in Genesis 37 and how Joseph dealt with the haters in his life. It says, now Israel, which was his dad, that was Joseph's dad. Now you know where the country came from. It was the dad, the father of Joseph, named after him. Loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. In other words, he was older when he had Joseph. Joseph was the baby. A any, any babies in the church today that you know that you're the favorite? You just know it. It doesn't matter. They say, oh, we love all our kids the same. No, they don't. Listen, they, they love the babies. I'm just kidding. And, <laughs> and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, uh-oh, and could not speak peacefully to him. They didn't like him for no reason. And here's what happened. Joseph made the mistake of sharing a dream. Joseph was a dreamer. He shared a dream with his brothers about him being over his brothers, that he was in a place of authority over his brothers. His brothers, they didn't want to hear that. They didn't like it. They were threatened by that. They started to hate. So it says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So jealousy sets in. They can't stand it. They start hating. Hating usually begins when you have something they don't. When you have something that someone else wants. It says, then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. In other words, wait, we don't want to kill him, but we want to do something to him. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So fast forward, cliff notes. Here's what happened. Joseph gets sold into slavery. While he's in slavery, 
he's having dreams. The Pharaoh, who's in charge politically of the land, said, wait a minute, this guy can help me. He pulls Joseph out of jail, but while he's got him out of jail, into the palace, out of the prison, into the palace, Pharaoh's wife sees him and is like, wow. She said, I got to have me some of that. She wants to hook up, shack up with Joseph. Joseph's a righteous guy. Joseph said, no way, no how. I'm not going to do it. So what she does, she can't stand when she can't get what she wanted. So she lies about it. She tells the Pharaoh, Joseph attacked me. Wasn't true at all. So Joseph said, or the Pharaoh said, oh, that's fine. Here's what we're going to do. Joseph, you're going back into jail. Now, while Joseph is in jail another time, he has a dream about the country that can really help Pharaoh out. And here's what Pharaoh says. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. So he's elevating him. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, we have set you over all of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took a signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed them in garments of fine linen. He put a gold chain about his neck, and he made him ride in his chariot, second chariot, and they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was making his mark. Joseph was on the rise. Joseph was being successful. But you have to know, as soon as you start making your mark, there's going to be those people that don't want to see you go from the place that you are to the place that God wants you to be. And Joseph's brothers, they can't handle it. How many of us know that there's some people you've got to be careful who you share your dreams with because they can't handle your blessing and your dream? You have to be careful. And Joseph shared his dream, and his brothers didn't like what they heard, they were threatened because they wanted what he had. Here's what I want to tell you. There's going to be some people that aren't excited about what you have because they don't have it. I promise you, if you put a picture of you in your 2016 Ford Mustang on Facebook, the guy that's driving the 1987 Honda Accord is not going to go, wow, like. <laughs> He's not going to do it. He's not going to respond. He's not going to make a comment. Why? There's people that want what you have, and if they don't have it, jealousy, envy, hatred sets in because you have something they don't. What people need to realize, what we need to realize, is God doesn't bless everyone the same way. God doesn't give all of us the same thing. God gives some of us different abilities than he gives other people. He gives us different talents. He wires us uniquely. We're not all the same. We're not designed to do the same thing. But what happens is, we get so caught up in what somebody else has, we think, wow, God gave them better, something better than he gave me. And we look at their life and we think that life is better than my life. And what you do is, is you're looking at them and all they have and all you don't have. And it never said that Joseph's brothers weren't blessed. It says that they were more interested in Joseph's blessing than their blessing. Listen, it's easy to miss your blessings when you're too busy counting somebody else's. Yeah. And they were interested in what everyone else had, and they missed what they had. Wow, God did something for them that he didn't do for me. God blesses different people in different ways. We look at their life and we think, I want that life. i got to have that life. Listen, back in the day they used to say this, be who you is, because if you is who you ain't, then you ain't who you is. <laughs> right? Be who you is, because if you is who you ain't, then you ain't who you is. What's the point? Imitation leads to limitation. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. Imitation leads to limitation. That you spend so much time trying to be someone else that you forget being the person that God called you to be. It's easy to look at someone else's life and go, oh, I want their life. Their life looks so great. Listen, what you're seeing is their highlight reel. You're not seeing the whole story. You're not seeing everything that's happening behind the scenes. Be very careful about being quick to want what someone else has because it's easy to miss what you do have. I want that. I want that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We, we're quick to make assumptions, aren't we? People make assumptions about your life. We make assumptions about other people's lives. And how did they get what they got? Well, the truth is we don't know what they had to do to get what they got. We just see where they are and we make a quick assumption. Listen, Joseph was in the palace, but how many of us know you've got to rewind he spent some time in the pit 
before he ever made it to the palace. And it's easy to look at people's lives and go, wow, how did they get that? How did they end up there? Well, you got to rewind. The Bible says this in Psalm 38, 19, many have become my enemies without cause. Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Have you ever had that happen? You know, it's one thing. If you don't want to like me, listen, I'm okay with that. You spend a little time with me, you're like, hmm, doesn't work for me. I'm good. But don't judge me until you spend some time with me, right? Don't, don't hate our church if you've never been to our church. Don't, don't make a rash judgment about it. If you come and you don't like it, then that's fine. But the, the thing I hate <laughs> about haters They judge my glory, but they don't know my story. Come on. Don't judge my glory until you know my story because you don't know what I had to do to get to the place that I am. It's easy to look at somebody's life and say, I should have had that job. Somebody looks at your life. It should have been me that had the job that they have. Yeah, what you don't know is while you went home at 5 o'clock, they were the ones that were staying late every night cleaning the place up that the boss recognized that everyone else has missed. Don't judge the glory until you know the story. There's a guy in here. I should have been the one that had that girl. I'm better looking. I'm smarter. What you don't know is while you were home at midnight watching ESPN drinking Natty Light, that brother was out texting her love letters from the Song of Solomon. I mean, you just don't know the story. You don't know the story. You try to judge someone's glory, but you don't know the story, there's people, guess what? They don't want to see you have a great marriage. Why? They don't have a great marriage, and if they can't have it, they don't want you to have it. There's people that don't want to see you doing well. Why? They're not doing so well. There's people that don't want to see you clean and sober. Why? They're not willing to get clean and sober, and they'd rather stay in the pit and complain about you being in the palace. Haters going to hate. What do you do? You have to learn how to shake it off. There's going to be people, listen, young people, they don't want to see you get straight A's. They don't want to see you succeed. They don't want to see you rise to the top. They don't want to see you follow Jesus because it's easier for them to stay mediocre. Listen, if you hear one thing today, and I know there's young people all over this place, but listen, God never designed you for mediocrity. He designed you for greatness. Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle for mediocrity. It's easy to judge, right? People are going to say, why are you so excited about church? Look at you, you're all fired about Jesus and church. Why are you so excited about church? See, what they don't know is, they don't know the first time that you walked through that door, where your life was at, that you were barely hanging on by a thread, and there was no hope in your life, and that you were on a downward spiral, Things weren't going great, but you walked through that door and you had an encounter with Christ. Listen, you might not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be and God's doing something in your life and he's building you up now and things are changing in your life. Listen, don't judge my glory until you know my story, until you know where I've been. Easy to do. Let's not be those people. Let's be careful about how we handle those people. So there's three things today I want to give you in how you handle Haters, first of all, number one, you need to be confident in your purpose. Be confident in your purpose. Exodus 9, 16. But God's saying this, I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all of the earth. I've raised you up for this purpose that I might show you my power and my name, God's saying, be proclaimed in all the earth. See, when you know your purpose, you know why you're here, and you know where you're going. When you know your purpose, you don't get upset and offended that you weren't invited to the party, that, that you weren't part of the A-list. Why? Because not only do you know who you are, more importantly, you know whose you are. Knowing your purpose isn't about having a great job, isn't about having a great car, isn't about things that you have, because you can have all of those things and still be unfulfilled. Knowing your purpose isn't about what you have, knowing your purpose is about who has you. 
When you know your purpose, people can criticize you. People can say things against you. People can attack you. But it doesn't affect you because you're less interested in what they're saying and what they're thinking, and you're more interested in what God's saying and what God's thinking about you. And you know that he said, you're the apple of my eye that you're my beloved, that he calls you the head and not the tail. We're more interested in what God thinks and what God says than what others think and, and what others are saying because it's so caught, easy to get caught up in what other people are saying in our life. So easy to get caught up in what others are saying, tweeting, Facebooking about you and about me. Easy to rise and fall with the opinion of others, isn't it? Rise and fall. Well, I'm feeling great. Everybody liked my Instagram. Everybody loved it. Well, nobody retweeted me. I must not be important. Nobody cares about me. Rise and fall, up and down. Nobody knows this better than Jesus. See, because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, everybody was liking his Instagram. Everybody was liking his Facebook. Everyone was retweeting him. But the following Friday, the same people that were loving him simply had turned against him and they put him on a cross. Don't rise and fall with the attitude, with the opinions of others. Praise and criticism, right? Oh, it feels good. It feels bad. Listen, praise and criticism are like chewing gum. You can chew on it, but don't swallow it. Hello? Chew on it. Don't swallow it. Take it in. Get, up, get rid of it. Spit it out. Your purpose is different than your performance. Don't confuse the two. Two different things. Here's why. Your performance is about you, your past, and what you've accomplished. But your purpose is about Jesus, your future, and the potential that he's placed in you. Don't confuse the two. One's about you, one's about God. Your purpose is about you, Christ, and the potential that he's placed in you to do something great. See, when you know your purpose, you don't get easily offended. When you know your purpose, you don't get easily distracted from what God's called you to. When you know your purpose, you grow where you're planted. When you know your purpose, you can deal with whatever haters come your way because you're confident in who you are and whose you are. And what is your purpose? Go back to Exodus. I might show his power and his name be proclaimed in all the earth. Come on, that's our purpose, church, that his name might be lifted up above all other names, that those that don't know him might come to know him and see their life radically change. That's our purpose. That's it. At the end of the day, that's what's going to matter in your life. That's our purpose. Second, you can handle haters by knowing who you're dealing with. You've got to know who you're dealing with. Joseph's brothers were lacking some brotherly love, weren't they? Look, Genesis 37, 4. Joseph's brothers hated him and would not be friendly to him. They threw him under the bus. Now, you would think that somebody else might do that. But how dare the people closest to me turn on me? How does that even happen? That's not how it's supposed to work, is it? Who can I trust? Let's look what the Bible says about who we can trust. Micah 7, verses 5 and 6. Here's what it said. Don't trust anyone. Wow. I didn't make it up. <laughs> Don't trust anyone. Not your best friend or even your wife. What? I can trust Linda. It says not to. For the son despises his father. The daughter defies her mother. I feel like we hit Nita. Dun, 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 dun. Don't we? All the moms are going, looking at their daughters right now. The daughter-in-law defies her mother-in-law. Your enemies are right in your own household. Wow. Right now, everybody's looking at the person beside them going, bro, I might have came with you, but I'm not going home with you. <laughs> I don't trust you. The Bible says not to trust. Don't trust. Got to be careful. Paranoid. We're all looking around. I thought I knew you. <laughs> so what do we do? Oh, I can't like anyone. I can't trust anyone. I got to go through my life like this. <laughs> no. Watch Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Who do we trust? We trust in the Lord with all of our heart. 
Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. He will show you what friends to have. Now, how about that? How about considering going to God first on who it is that you should be doing life with? Some people are here today, oh, that's weird. I've got to go to God before I pick a friend? Maybe. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. I believe in the next 15 seconds that God will speak to you in a very personal way about somebody that you're not sure about that's in your inner circle that maybe shouldn't be. Here's what I want you to do. Run that person right now through the God filter. Take that person right now in the God filter in your mind and say, is this person that I'm doing life with, that I'm hanging with, that I'm spending time with, are they helping me to be a better person and fulfill my purpose? Or are they distracting me from the purpose that God has placed in my life? And right now, you already know if you need to delete them from your iPhone or not. I don't have to say anything else. You already know. You already know. You got to know who you're dealing with. Lean into God, is what he's saying. Trust him. I'm not sure which way to go. I'm not sure what to do. Who do I trust? These people are coming against me. Lean into God. The Bible says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. So, when it comes to friends, what I like to do, what I'm going to recommend that you do, is you use the Jesus model for friendship. What does that mean? Large group of acquaintances, small circle of friends. Large group of acquaintances. Hey, man, how you doing? How's it going? How about the Steelers? Boom. Love you. Awesome. Small group of friends. Hey, would you pray for me because this is going on in my life? Can I talk to you about something? Because I need to talk to somebody that I can trust. Small group. Jesus had Peter, John, James. Who do you have? Small group. Lean in on. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. How do you do that? People go, whoa, God's out there. Don't ever miss that there's people in your life that are filled with the very Spirit of God. And if you want to draw near to God, you need to draw near to some people that are filled with the Spirit of God in your life. Draw near to the people that's filled with the Spirit of God. So, when it comes to large groups, the problem that I have, maybe you have this problem as well, it seems like it's always people on the outside that are giving you the advice of what you're doing wrong. Anybody else deal with that? It's the people that are, they don't really know your story. They're, they're out here, but they want to give you advice on what it is that you're doing wrong. And I'm like, why should people that can't get it together be trying to tell me how to get it together? Did you ever think about that? You got to be careful about who you let speak into your life, who you let give you advice. For example, if I want advice on my marriage, I'm not going to get it from somebody that's been divorced five times. Right. I want to go to somebody that's been married 50 years and has a solid marriage. That's who I'm going to go to. If I want good financial, sound financial advice for me, I'm not going to get it from somebody that's been bankrupt four times. I'm not going to do it. I want to go talk to somebody that's driving a nicer car than me. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? If I'm deciding that I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to go to a personal trainer. Why should I go to someone, when I'm trying to get a six-pack, I look at him, he's got the whole keg. No way. <laughs> I want to look at somebody, and look, they, they look better than me, if I'm going to get a personal trainer. It just makes sense, doesn't it? It's what we need to do. Anyhow, it's what we need to do. So, <laughs> quick question. How many people here... Eventually, you want to be married. Just put your hand up. Single people, you want to be married someday? Awesome. How many of you, you're married right now and you don't want to be put your hand up? It's a joke. It's a trick. Don't do it. Don't do it. I want to help you. Single people. Guys, listen to me. If you want to know what the girl's going to be like that you're considering marrying, go check out her mama. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I'm not saying it's going to be exactly the same. There'll be things that are similar. Girls, you want to see what your hubby's going to be like? Go check out his daddy. 
Why? Apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree. Here's some good advice. Listen, general advice, but I believe, to, I believe it's true. If you're going to get hooked up with somebody that you're planning on spending the rest of your life with, you need to dive into the family a little bit. You need to know what you're dealing with, how to handle the people that you're going to be around. You need to go to a barbecue. You need to go to a family reunion. You need to go hang out with Cousin Poochie and Brother and Bob, Billy, and spend some time with them. Because I promise you, if there's dysfunction there, whoa, 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 it's out on the family tree. There's also, we all have nuts in the family tree. It's, <laughs> it's going to show up. It's going to show up. You just... I'm not saying that's bad, right, or wrong. I'm saying you need to know because if you're going to handle your haters, you have to know who you're dealing with. You have to be prepared for what's coming your way. Is this helping anybody today? You in the back. God bless you today. Hey, I see you guys back there. I love you guys. Thank you. For the rest of you, you just need to get with the program in here, all right? God's word. It's life-changing. Here's the last point. If you're going to handle haters, you've got to remember they may be derogative, but what you have is by divine prerogative. This is about to get good. Watch. See, the problem that Joseph's brothers had, and maybe the problem that your haters, the people that come against you have, is they're seeing your situation through the natural, and what they don't realize is you're connected to the heavenlies. Genesis 39, watch. While Joseph was in prison, the Lord helped him and was good to him. He even made the jailer like Joseph so much that he put him in charge of the other prisoners and of everything that was done in the jail. He begins to elevate him. The jailer did not worry about anything because the Lord was with Joseph and made him successful in all that he did. Just because Joseph was in jail doesn't mean that God wasn't moving in Joseph's life. And what you need to know, maybe you're not exactly where you want to be doing exactly what you want to do, but it doesn't mean that God's not moving in your life. Maybe your circumstances aren't exactly the way that you want it. But you need to know today, and you need to take heart in this. It doesn't mean that God's not at work in your life. That God was fulfilling Joseph's purpose. He was fulfilling his purpose. And it didn't look like it from the outside. Because he had to go through some bad times, didn't he? Before he got to some good times. But Joseph didn't ask for anything that happened to him. It's just where God needed him to be for that period of time so that he could fulfill his purpose. But what I know is through the whole thing, Joseph never stopped trusting God. He never stopped trusting God. And it's interesting because Joseph was young. He was inexperienced. He, he didn't have support. He didn't have everything that he needed. But what he did have was far more than a robe that his earthly father gave him. What he had was favor that his heavenly father gave him. And I want to tell you, favor will get you what you don't deserve because favor ain't fair. Favor ain't fair. Tell the person beside you. Just tell them right now. Favor ain't fair. You need to know. Favor ain't fair. God's favor, God's favor, him doing you a favor, is not fair. Why? Because God gives it to you at his prerogative so he can get the glory. God gives you favor. God does something for you just because he wants to so that he can get the glory. That way, when the haters start hating, you can say, don't blame me. I didn't do it. Come on, it's my heavenly father that gave me this. I'm not smart enough for this. I'm not educated enough for this. I'm not good enough for this. But God get, did me a favor, not because he had to. Come on, because he wanted to. Not because he loves me, but because he likes me. Come on, favor's not fair. Favor's not fair. God uses it in your life. So the watching world will be like, what's going on in their world? And here, watch. Let's wrap this thing up. Stay locked in. Here is how God can use favor in your life to help somebody that's hating you. There will be a door that opens up, a conversation perhaps, with someone that's hating you. Because go back to the beginning of this message. What do haters want? They want something that they don't have 
that you have. And what it is, it's not your new car, it's not your new house. What they want that you have is your ability to get through a tough time. When everyone else is crumbling around you, you're the one that's still standing tall. What they want is the ability to, to look at your life and say, I, I want that thing that they have that keeps them standing in the midst of the storm. That, that's what I, I need in my life. They, they want that thing so desperately, and it's an opportunity for you to look them square in the eye and say, listen, what I have, I don't deserve. And the greatest favor that God ever did for me is he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on a cross that whomever would believe and trust in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the greatest favor that God's done for you. Come on, that's the greatest favor you'll ever do for anyone else. You'll point people back to Jesus. Let me ask you a question today. Has God ever done anybody in this place a favor? Come on, has God ever blessed anybody in here today? Somebody got a roof over their head today? Come on, somebody got a couple dollars in their pocket today? Come on, somebody drive here in a car today? Why? God did you a favor today. Come on, you got some friends today? Come on, celebrate God's goodness. God did you a favor. You have what you have because he chose to give it to you. You are blessed the way that you are blessed because God did you a favor. High five somebody beside you and say, favor ain't fair, but God's still going to bless. You can say that last part. God's still going to bless. That's the most important part. Favor ain't fair. Haters going to hate. God's still going to bless. Let's pray together and ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, thank you today. This day, I believe that your church has been encouraged by your word, not my words, to understand that it's critical, God. We're in a critical time that we learn how to respond, how to deal with, how to quit being haters. Because, God, we're made in your image and your word tells us that you are love. And we know love covers a multitude of sins. And I'd ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for one moment today. I think that there's some people here, maybe you've been on the receiving end of some hate, some people coming against you, and you weren't sure how to process it, you weren't sure what to do with it, and now God spoke to you. Maybe you've been doing some hating been coming against some people in your life, but you've heard clearly from God. If that's been you today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've heard from God today, just slip your hand up in the air and say, wow, that, that was me today. I, I was struggling with some of this stuff, hands going up all over the room. Just put your hand up right now. Just put it up. That's me. Real life. This is real life. Hands still going up. I'm struggling. But God, I believe that you've spoke to our hearts. God, and right now you're rearranging the very fiber of who we are to be less like who we were and more like you. God, that you're putting us back together, that we're under construction. God, maybe not exactly how we want to be, but we know we're not the way that we used to be because of Jesus Christ in our life. God, speak to us. Help us apply these principles to our everyday life, these timeless principles to our everyday life. You can put your hands down. If you keep your eyes closed and heads bowed for just a another moment. Maybe you're here today. First time, maybe you've been here, but something is just different today. And you know that potentially there's a gap in your life. There's a hole in your life that you've been trying to fill with something. Maybe it's stuff, people. I don't know what it is, but I want to tell you the thing that you've been looking for isn't stuff. It's a person that has a name and it's Jesus. And you can begin a relationship with him right now by simply inviting him into your life and we want to give you an opportunity to do that and what that does is it really it erases your past every sin every mistake every regret every bit of guilt every bit of shame can be gone in one moment by faith simply trusting that what Jesus did on the cross paid for all of that it can give you a new life today and can seal your eternity with God forever on the count of three, if you want to begin that new life, simply in a very holy moment between you and God, just slip your hand up in the air and say, that's me. On the count of three, one, two, three, I want this new life. Wow. Praise God today. Hands still going up. God bless you. The Bible says that the angels rejoice at this moment, that your past is forgiven at this moment, that your shame is gone, that you're guilt-free. God's doing a work in your life. It starts today. If you'll pray after me. Father, I'm sorry I've sinned and made mistakes, but I believe what Jesus did on the cross paid for every sin. 
Father, right now I believe I'm forgiven and in good standing with you. You're no longer mad at me, but you're madly in love with me, not because of anything that I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. Now, God, set me on this new path. Give me this new life. Help me get plugged in right here into your church, a place where I'm not discouraged, but encouraged to fulfill my purpose that I would make your name famous throughout the world. God, we thank you collectively as a church for who you are, all that you're doing. God, we know you're incredible. The God that we serve is not dead. He's alive. And because of that, we believe with all of our hearts that the best is yet to come. We pray it in Jesus' name today. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for another great message here at our church. Right now is our time of offering. Glad you guys are here with us here today. between science and faith. Only on God blinded me with science! Listen, it's going to be a great series. Starts next week. You don't want to miss it. Bring some friends.